Um, thank you, everyone. My name is Wilson. Can you hear me okay at the back? Cool. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Wilson. I'm from ThoughtWorks. And before we start, I just wanted to mention that the code examples is available on my GitHub, uh, Wilson Chi slash Python dash Asia 2018. I will be showing some sample code, but it'll be just a snippet. So if you want to see the real code, uh, just go to the to the GitHub. Okay. The title of the talk is writing robust and maintainable concurrent program in Python, but I actually like to refer to it as what lessons can we learn from food seller about concurrency? Now, if you look at the picture here, there are uh, three types of food seller. The first one on the very left is the ice cream uncle. Those of you who are new to Singapore, you can find them along Orchard Road. They usually work alone, and so they receive the order, they prepare the ice cream, and then they give back. They, they, they prepare the ice cream and give the ice cream to the customers. So it's a, there's no concurrency model here, so it's just a sequential operation. As we move to the second one, that is uh, usually a sandwich shop. Now, a sandwich shop usually employs some form of uh, pipelining as their concurrency model. So you start the pipeline with an empty bread, and then as it goes through the pipeline, more and more items get put inside your bread. And finally, the last one is the most complex out of the three. So this is usually employed by fast food chains. Um, there will be multiple cashiers, multiple food preparers working together at the same time. Now, when I look at our application, actually, I can ask food sellers because essentially they receive the requests and they will try uh, to fully utilize their resource as much as possible so that they can produce a quick response, which is the same as our application. And also, um, when we write our application, usually we start off with the sequential code. But then as it goes to production, we wanted to improve it more and more. We want to make it faster. So sometimes we need to introduce concurrency model into it. So that's the main motivation of this presentation. So I just wanted to go some of the basic uh, some, some of the basic principles and tips in writing this code so that it can translate to multiple concurrency model. <coughs> okay, and we're going to look at it um, through an example. So the example is the simulations of making of Koela Pisagu. Um, Koela Pisagu is a traditional snack in Southeast Asia. And as you can see, it has many layers of colors. Uh, actually, there are only three colors, magenta, green, and white and then it just repeats itself. Now, when you make koela pisagu, first you need to have the ingredients, flowers, and some colorings. You then have to mix them together. After you finish mixing it, you have the color mixtures, and then you start pouring it one by one. We, it probably looks something like this. So, built layer, it receives a tray, and then it starts the mix operation. And once the mixing is complete, you then start pouring the color one by one, magenta, green, and white. Uh, if, we look, if we dig deeper into the code, if you look at the start mixer and the pour color mixture, I implemented a perform operation method there. Uh, there's nothing special in that perform operations. It's just a loop with a big number and also some random calculations. There's nothing special. It's just to keep the processor busy when it's running. And I also specify a number there, perform operation 1.0. That means that operation should take one second, whereas the second one, it will take about 0.05 second. So the build layer builds three colors, magenta, green, and white. And if we were to make a Koela Pisago, we need more than that. So we are going to loop. So the main method will first instantiate a tray, and then it will loop four times to build the layer one by one. Now, if we were to make this code concurrent, the first thing that comes to mind is to create a thread. We use threading. And thankfully, in Python, to create thread is very easy. So this is how it looks like. Um, we need to import thread from threading module. And then in the main thread itself, there's almost no modifications. You still instantiate a tray. You still have that for loop for four times. But instead of calling the build layer directly, we actually instantiate the thread and telling the thread, okay, please 
call this build layer on a separate thread and pass in the arguments. And then after that, we can start the thread. Eventually, we'll have to join it, but I'm not showing it here. So let's see how it behaves. So I'm going to call that code. I'm not going to show it because of the limitation of time. And this code will run both the sequential and the multi-threaded ones. So that's the first one, sequential. It takes four seconds. And that's the second one, that's multi-threaded, and it takes 4.6 seconds. So it's actually slower. Let's repeat that again. <coughs> 3.9, that's sequential. And 4.6 seconds. So it's always slower. Is there a bug in our code? No, yeah, there is no bug. That is, in fact, how Python multi-threading behaves. So when we do when we create thread in Python, actually they do make use of the thread provided by the operating system. And ever since the introduction of multi-core CPUs, those threads can actually run on multiple cores, achieving parallelism. My computer have four cores, so I create four threads, they should be able to parallelize. But actually Python is an interpreted language and as it runs through the code, it interprets it and it's and to avoid any synchronization problem inside the interpreter, Python introduced a GIL, which is the global interpreter lock, which essentially ensures that only one thread can run at, the, at a time. So to put it in an analogy of uh, food preparations, let's assume that we have those four threads. Those four threads are ready to build the coil lapis. But unfortunately, because of the GIL, there's only one work table and there is a scheduler entity there that will decide who can take the table at one time. So perhaps it decides, okay, A, now you can go ahead and do it. And then after A work for a certain period of time, the scheduler will decide, okay, stop, it's time for B to take the table. And so on for B and for C also. There are two problems here. One is performance because this is essentially sequential. Everything just runs one by one. In fact, it's going to be slower because there is context switching involved. Uh, there is another problem that we will see a little bit later, but the problem is the, because you're running your code, for example, A is running your code, uh, running his code. He built the, he do the mixing, he pour magenta color, but then as he is about to pour the green colors to build the coil lapis, the scheduler said, stop working, it's time for B to pick it up. So then B pick it up. And then he finished and he poured another magenta color. So you can see that sometimes you will get an incorrect uh, sequence of layers. We'll get, we're going to see that later. So the question is, with, with those two problems, what is the purpose of threading in Python? Actually, there is a purpose. And that's because there are two types of operations that we have. One is called compute operations. That's the thing that happens in your processor. So whenever you do calculations, you do your panda manipulations, NumPy calculations, they all run in the processor. This is a compute operation. Um, there is also another type, which is the I.O. operations. Now, I.O. operations are those that doesn't happen in the processor. For example, if you're asking your disk to copy large files from one folder to the other, you just send an instruction and then the disk will do it itself. Another thing is if you um, do a large file network transfers or m maybe you are making an HTTP call somewhere else. When that happens, your processors just wait till the IO operation comes back and only then it starts working again. So it remains idle there. Python interpreter actually release the GIL when it's, uh, when it's an IO operations. So when they are doing these IO operations, if A is already on the work table, it allows B to be also on that table. So essentially we can achieve parallelism if it's an IO operation. So I'm just gonna show a quick demo. So I'm gonna change the mixer to perform IO operations instead of operations. And inside this IO operation is just time.sleep. It's just a simulation of an IO operations. So let's have a look. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, I'm there. There we go, one seconds. 
So it is, we achieve parallelism in this case because it's an IO operation. And as you can see, you can see the synchronization problem where you have the incorrect layering there. Okay. So the first step, oh, sorry, let me go back to the slide. The first step is use multi-threading for IO operations, but watch out for synchronization problem due to preemption. So the next question is, what if actually I want to achieve parallelism for um, a compute operation? Thankfully in Python, yes, there is a way to do it. We import a process from the multiprocessing module. And if you look at the code, there is very minimal change. And if uh, I can't really see my pointer here, but just below the for loop, if originally we instantiate a thread, in here we instantiate a process. And what happens internally is that Python will create an operating system processes and so that it can run in parallel. It, for each of the process, it has its own Python interpreter inside. So it's more expensive than a thread because now for four process, you would have four Python interpreters running at the same time. And to put back the analogy of that work table, so now A, B, C, D, they all have their own work table. They can do in parallel. Um, one thing that you need to pay attention for is if, if you can see from multiprocessing, I do two imports, process and queue. Um, because the process are running separately, they are not sharing the memory. So whenever you send an argument to the process, it needs to go through serialization. And in this case, because of that serialization, at the new process, you get a new instance of tray. So to send that back, I make use of the multiprocessing queue. So tip number two, use multiprocessing to achieve parallelism for compute operations. However, do watch out for the need for pickle, op uh, pickle protocol for serialization. Okay, now we are going to the most important one, which is the synchronization problem that we see just now. Um, there are at least three approaches that we can do to avoid the synchronization problem. The first one is to use a sync IO. Um, unfortunately, when I practice with it, I realize that I will overrun the time because I cannot do justice in that topic. So I'm just going to skip that one. We'll go see the other two lesson, uh, the other two solution. First solution is to use lock. So in threading, we can actually use a threading lock, and essentially it's to protect the critical section in our code so that it doesn't. Um, when A is working on it, on that part, B would not be able to do that. So, for example, if A comes in and he already finished the mixing, he's now pouring the color mixtures for the first one. And then scheduler said, okay, time for B to take the table. B comes in and he sees, his, when he's about to enter that portion, he sees the lock is already acquired by A. In that case, B will back up and then let A finish before he can continue. I put a question mark there. Um, the reason is because for simple applications using a lot really works. The problem is once you have a lot of uh, big applications and there are many locks, there is a chance of that lock occurring when you are running an operations with multiple locks. So when possible, don't, do not use lock, but if it's truly necessary, yes, and encapsulate it well. So without the lock, what do we do? Solution number two, always design for concurrency. There's a very good book, uh, Pragmatic Programmer by Andrew Hahn and Dave Thomas, where they give you tips on how to write better programs. And one of the tip, tip 41, says always design for concurrency. That's to prevent programming by coincidence. What does it mean by programming by coincidence? Programming by coincidence means your code works for this scenario, but for other scenarios, it doesn't work. And more often than not, that other scenario is concurrent code, which is why the tip is always designed for concurrency. And in that book, um, Andrew Hunt and Dave Thomas said that to design for concurrency means you need to encapsulate and watch out for your state. And to me, there are two ways to do it. One is to follow the principle of functional programming, where there is no shared state and no um, side effect. And the other one is to modify your state so that it's idempotent. Let's have a look at an example. 
Um, let's look at our original code and if you see just below the main thread there's the instantiation of the tray and then you go to the loop in the line where we instantiate the thread we pass in the tray there so that is the same instance of tray being shared among all four threads so it breaks that principle this is a shared state what about side effect side effect means if you enter a method and in that method you change the state you, you modify a shared state that means you're causing a side effect so in this case this um, solution that we have actually break both rules it has a shared state and it has side effects so what is it that we are trying to achieve then if we want to say that there shouldn't be any shared state and there shouldn't be any side effect what we want is actually something like this now those of you who actually make real life Koela Pisago will say that this is not possible <laughs> but because this is um, this is software so we can do it <coughs> So what we want to do is for each layer, uh, sorry, for each thread, for example, this is two thread A and B, they will have their own tray and they would build their own, um, they would pour the colors onto their trays only. Once all the thread is finished and they're joined together, we can then combine those threads together to build the, the Quella piece. Now, because they have their own tray, it doesn't matter if they get preempted because there won't be any uh, synchronization problem. So how do we do that in code? Um, this is a simple way to do it. So instead of creating the tray prior to the for loop, we create the tray inside the for loop. Um, two things here. One, it still have a side effect because you are changing something outside. Two, it's the code is very long actually. Now the reason is because the basic threading in Python doesn't allow you to return any value. So there is no return from a thread, which is why I still need to send in the tray and then let the individual build layer actually populate that tray. But it's not a shared tray anymore. But thankfully, since I think 2010, there's a new library, Concurrent Futures, where you can use thread pool executor. Now the thread pool executor, when you instantiate it, so inside the main loop with thread pool executor as pool, when you instantiate it, it creates a pool of thread that's ready to use. And if you look at, sorry, I'm just going to go back to that picture again. This is exactly is something that's like a map reduce operation because first you need to map all those to your individual tray. And then once you have all those trays, you've reduced them. And that actually is very nicely done with the thread pool map and then passing in the method, a build layer. And another beautiful thing about the pool.map is that it allows you to return a value. So that result there contains all the trace. And then you can then just do the final reduce. Okay. Now the next thing that we can do is uh, to change your state so that it's idempotent. I'm, I'm going to try to read the, the meaning of idempotent. Idempotent state means the meaning of the state does not change even when update to the state happens in different sequences. Uh, let me try to explain. Now these three, these three trays here shows a possible example when we run our multi-threaded code. And as you can see, obviously they are different, right? Because so the state that they produce are actually different just because the state, uh, the update to the state is different every time. So what do we do so that this actually mean the same thing? An easy way. Not only we pour colors into the tray, we also tell for each color what would be the eventual positions of that color. Once again, it doesn't make sense for real, but in this case, we can do that. And the meaning of each of these trays are the same now because essentially they're saying for every tray there will be two magenta colors, two green colors, and two uh, white color. And the position for the magenta color will be one and four. The position for the green will be two and five. So no matter what the sequence is, they meant, they meant the same thing. And once we do that, we can actually just perform the translation to produce the final tray. 
Um, there's, there's further discussions in the final chapter of the book seven, Concurrency Models in Seven Weeks. It talks about how idempotent state actually helps them in a lambda architecture. It's a very interesting topic. Do have a look. So design for concurrency. There are three tips. One, when you write your code, try to not have shared state, no side effect in your functions or your methods. Use pool.map from concurrent futures because then your thread can return a value. And finally, try to have an idempotent state. Okay, now once we have that code designed for concurrency, we can use any type of concurrency model that we, we can think of because we are sure that those states are encapsulated and there will not be any synchronization problem between those states. And we're going to look at a second example actually, uh, the one that we started with actually, a restaurant queuing system. So imagine we have a restaurant and there are already 12 customers in the queue and we would like to serve those customers. And by serving, what it means is it will first, the, the uh, restaurant staff will first take the order. Uh, everybody orders the same thing. So we will prepare a sandwich, prepare quail apis, prepare ice cream and prepare milkshake. So how do we, um, how do we actually create the concurrent model for this? The first and the easiest one is use an embarrassingly parallel approach. And we just let them run at separate process because they just they can just run. So it's essentially it's going to look like this. So when the queue comes in, there are four counters open, but then all those people uh, serving the customers, they will also prepare the food, they will also cook. So everything run in parallel. And since our code is designed for concurrency, we don't have to worry, we'll just use it. And the code looks like this, actually, it's very, very simple. Instead of using a thread pool executor, we use process pool executor. We call the map, calling that prepare order, and everything will just work. So I'm just gonna show um, the performance of it. I don't have to show the sequential performance because it will take 80 seconds, and we don't have time for that. So as you can see, at any time, four customers will be served. So that's the first four customers because we have four parallel process. And then that, that's the second eight, uh, sorry, second four. And that's the final four. So it took 21 seconds. So the original, you just have to keep my words on it. A sequential is 80 seconds. So this is 21 seconds, it's four times faster. Now the next thing that we need to think of is, is there any other thing we can do to improve this one here? So now we we've just do an embarrassingly parallel. We need to think of, is there any IO operations inside here? Because if there's any IO operations and we do embarrassingly parallel, each process will just run. And when it do a, an IO call, that processor will just wait until the, the IO operation finish. And when he's idling there, the processor is not doing anything. So is there anything we can do? Well, we know already that the quail apis have IO operations. And in fact, in my code, I put an IO operation also when we prepare the milkshake. Because for those, we can actually use an automated mixer and we can also use a blender to do it. So those are IO operations, we delegate it. So coming back to here. Look for an IO operation and implement the fan out and fan in model. So essentially what we want is for those that runs IO operations, we want them to run on a separate thread. That way we can fully um, utilize our processor. So it's not gonna just stay idle while waiting for the IO operations to complete. An easy way to do it is just to create a thread for each of this. But actually a better way to do it is to use a sync fantastic talk by Bren Slatkin, PyCon 2014. I put a link there to the YouTube where he talks about how to do fan out and fan in um, for a web crawler. And the code would look something like this if we use a sync IO. So the prepare quail lapis and prepare mil milkshake, we need to change it to uh, asynchronous coroutines. I, I do not have time to show that, but I'm just gonna show how it looks like. And when we call those coroutines in it will return a future object. And that future object, we can then await at the end. 
So the first two lines is where we do a fan out, let it run separately. And then the prepare sandwich and the prepare ice cream is continuing on that uh, execution part. And then at the end, we will then wait for the fan out. So essentially, fan out, fan in, because we then have to join it again. So let's see the performance. So that one take 20, 21 seconds. So this fan out and fan in means we still do embarrassingly parallel, but for each process, we actually spawn more. We do the asynchronous programming there. So it's still going to work at four at a, at a time. Okay, that's the final four. And as you can see, it's 16 seconds now. So there's five second improvement because we are now fully utilizing the processor when it's doing an IO operations. Finally, um, if you look at the flow just now, if I, if I run it again, there's always four people at the time. So to me, it looks, if you have a restaurant, it seems like the queue is moving slower because you don't move, right? You need to wait for that four person to come in to, to get served and then you go again. Is there a way for us to actually make it better? Um, if we learn from fast food restaurants, they always have the dedicated So first, they will be the cashier. Their job is just to accept orders. And then once they get the order, they then pass it to the next one that do the food preparations. So for that, sorry, let me go back to the slide. We can use pipelining. So essentially what it means is like this. So we have a pipeline. First, we have a customer queue and then it goes in to the cashier. That is a dedicated person that will actually handle just taking the order. And then after that, he can receive the order, pass it to the next one, which is the food preparer. And the best way to do that in Python is to use producer consumer queue. Essentially, what it means here is uh, the boxes are process. So they are all separate process. And the arrows are the queues. These are multi-processing queue. What each individual process do is just within in, inside that it will just loop, get something from the queue, process it, and then pass it to the next one. You can look at the code in the GitHub, uh, but I'm just going to show the main method. So in here, the first three lines are the creations of the queue. And then after that, we can then create those uh, individual I call it actor here because they're serving a role the first one is the cashier and in the instantiation of the actor we tell the incoming queue is customer queue and the outgoing queue is order queue and then what it does is take order so you will take the order and produce the order slip go to the next one which is the preparer so the next one is the food preparer now the nice thing about this is if you ever want to increase the number of people working on a cashier, you can just replicate that code and name it differently. So cashier one, do that, cashier two, do that. Then there will be two process handling the cashier. In this case, I only have two handling the preparer. And let's have a look at the performance. Um, in this code, I will have one cashiers and four food preparers. So let's have a look. As you can see, the queue moves much smoother now. Everybody gets their order quickly. That means we get their money faster and also they can sit down in the restaurant. And finally, when it completes, it's 17 seconds. So it's just a little bit slower because we dedicate one person not for the food preparation. One person will be a cashier and then the remaining will do the food preparations. That is actually all that I wanted to share. So, sorry, let me go back to the slide. In summary, always design for concurrency. That's really the basic uh, ingredients. You need to have no shared state, no, um, no side effect, and if possible, uh, create an idempotent state. Once you do that, um, that, that's relevant for any languages, not only Python. For Python, understand the basic building block of concurrency in Python. So there's multi-threading, multi-processing, and as I mentioned, unfortunately, I, I'm not able to co cover async I.O., which is a very fascinating topic. And finally, 
when you eventually write your concurrent application, try to make use of the available model. Don't just use threads everywhere. Try to use pipelining, try to use fan out and fan in. And that's all. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Mm. For the multi trading, yes. Uh, yeah, are you an async? Yes. This is single core. That's so, right. Uh, what are some patterns to leverage the other flows of your CPU in your machine? Um, so there are three, right? Multi threading. It use it sort of use a, it, it uses multiple cores. It's just that they take uh, one time at uh, one turn at a time. Multi process actually use multi cores. If you use a sync I/O. Um, so d actually, when I prepared the slides, uh, if you remember my work work table analogy. Um, the async IO actually means you have one table, you have one person, one very disciplined person that knows the recipe of the other person, and then they, he will do it diligently. So he do something, oh, he decide this is an IO operation, I pick up another things. So that's async IO, it's single. It's single. If you want to use um, multi cores for async IO, you can actually make use of the loop dot, uh, can't remember the name now. But you can create a process executor inside your async IO, and then it will just spawn off a new process, and you can await that creation, which actually is very nice. So instead of creating a process and then you have to join it at the end, you'll just await and then create that process. When it's finished, it's going to come back. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also the yeah. So I wonder if the SPU should help you to prevent the backlogs in terms of trying to write to the same thing. Because when you mentioned about that log, you decide to mention that all the threads are the same thing. Yes. So in that case, the queue is useful rather than putting on logs just, just to prevent the balance. Yeah, so the question is. Um, would a queue help in solving this problem when we have that synchronization problem? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. Um, the queue helps in a way that I mean, it's it's a concurrent queue, so everything goes in at one time. It's still gonna have that problem because you have multiple threads, right? And then one put in color red to that queue, and then if the second one comes in the second thread execute and he also put that color after that then you still have that problem a better way is if the queue you have separate queue for each thread yeah yeah okay mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. How, does the, how does the lock work does it modify the object the thread is working on or is it like keeps its own internal state of each, of each thread um so the question is how does the lock work yeah. Actually, I, to be honest, I haven't studied the internals of the lock, but the way I understand it is, using the analogy again, if somebody enters into a lock, so he sort of like create a room for himself. So he lock it and nobody else can enter. So he acquired the lock first, he goes in, finish his job, and then after that he go out and then release the lock and the next person can come in. I mean, what is it, um, Jim, does it, would, it, would it be the case if you have two threads doing two completely different things? Is it still locked until the first one's finished? Or it depends what you're doing? Uh, it, so you need to share that lock among these two threads, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I was wondering, when we traverse three, we have like DFS or DFS, yeah. then how can we apply this and concurrent model? Mm. That's a very good question, actually. So how do we uh, apply concurrency in um, tree traversal? I need to think about that. <laughs> yeah. Back to you. Yeah. Did I spot one over here? Yeah. Any more questions from anyone else? OK, if not, say thank you very much. Again. Thank you.